Hello, welcome. It's so good of you to join me. Um, I am delighted that you're here. We're gonna wait a little bit and just have people kind of filter in. If you would over in the comment box, just put you know, where you're from. It's always nice to see how far and wide um, we have folks joining us. Um, inevitably, we have someone from overseas too, from I think last time we had the Netherlands show up as well as, um, oh, I think it was Spain. So um, if, you are, uh, if you are capable over there of, of just typing in your city and state, I would love to know where you're from. And I just appreciate you um, spending a little time with me today. We have a lot of great things um, scheduled for you today. And I think that you're going to um, really enjoy our topic as well as I can't wait to, see, to show you the, um, the quilt that um, I designed uh, that someone submitted uh, to get some help with and some thoughts and ideas on how to quilt it. Um, so I've got a lot of great things to share with you. And I just appreciate you um, tuning in and just remember that if you can't watch it live for whatever reason, we always do record our Quilt of Joy Clubhouse meetings. So you can always watch them and go back and, and watch old um, editions of the Clubhouse meetings on our YouTube channel. So um, I appreciate you being here. Uh, do we have anybody? Uh, uh, headed in, Jesse. Uh -huh. Oh, do we have anyone um, that has entered our our yeah, chat room? Absolutely, we've got uh, uh, Naomi. From, Naomi. Uh, Foley, Maryland. From Maryland. Hi, Naomi. Uh, let's see. We've got Judy Reed from Canada. Hey, Judy, Canada. <laughs> Oh, all right. Hi, Sandra. Well, um, hopefully everybody is kind of wandering in and getting settled. Um, I, I want to be sure that you are signed up for our Quilted Joy newsletter. We always um, remind you in the newsletter that there's a Quilted Joy Clubhouse meeting. And we also um, let you know in the newsletter when we have the replays um, set up so that you can go back and rewatch. And then um, I think you'll find it interesting in our newsletter, we include little fun links. So in the newsletter that went out today, there was a link that we included to a quilt from, I want to say 1863-ish, um, that came um, through the Oregon Trail with a pioneer, and they found it and resurrected it. They found it in a dump and resurrected it, and it's glorious. Um, so that was one link. We had a link on there for baby quilts. We have uh, one of our employees here, Rachel. She had a little bouncing baby boy um, in October. So we included a link um, for some NICU baby quilts that I think you'll enjoy. And then uh, one of our other employees, Kelsey, um, she got married in October. And so we included a link um, about quilts for uh, weddings and how to make those special for the people in your life that you want to bless with a quilt. Um, so I hope you're in the newsletter. I think that you're going to get a lot out of it. We also just finished our week-long series of free motion designs for the fall holiday season. And I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, it was fun to see people trying and drawing and sketching um, the designs. We had bats and we had pumpkins and we had... Oh, uh, apple sliced apples and ghosts and, and witches hats, um, glam hats and woodland uh, wizard hats. And um, each day we um, had a downloadable worksheet. And so if you were in our newsletter list, you got that in your inbox, you could download the worksheet and um, trace that or draw that out and then take that to your quilt whenever you need a border design or a fun all over uh, edge to edge design that has a holiday, a fall holiday theme. So, um, so I think there's a lot of stuff in there we really try to kind of spoil you with our newsletter and try to give you a lot of great um, tips and tricks and tutorials and hopefully you have found that helpful. Um, but today, now we have had in uh, the year of 2020, we have had a year of feathers. We started out with um, feather plumes and spines and how to put feathers in a diamond and how to put feathers in a square. We really played around with a lot of feathers and I hope that you found that helpful and I hope that you have found a feather plume that speaks to you, one that kind of comes more naturally to you. And we are going to kind of end our year with a feather Feathered wreath. Now, the traditional feathered wreath 
is challenging. So if you are new to machine quilting, um, don't get all bunched up about this. If you have the concepts in your head and you can work towards a wreath, um, I, that's what I want for you. I just want you to practice and kind of get to know how to create um, a wreath. But don't expect perfection, right? From day one, it's not gonna happen. So this is one of those skills that you build towards. But I want you to see how it's created and really the, the secret, the key to um, making a feathered wreath is in preparing the space you're going to feather and putting as many registration lines to help you stay oriented as you can. So what I've got here on the, I'm actually, Kelsey, I think I'm going to take this camera if that's okay. Um, so what I've got here on the fabric is I've just got a six inch block that I've stitched out and then I've put my registration line. So the, the six inch block um, I've stitched and then I went ahead at the three inch mark and just did a crosshair. So now I have it equally divided and then I've got three circles marked. I've got an outer ring, I've got an inner ring, and I've got the center ring. So this, the middle ring, that's the ring that I'm actually going to stitch. That is my spine. The outer ring is my boundary for where that outer portion of feather is going to come out. It gives me kind of a fence or a boundary so I know where to stop my feather. The inner ring tells me, again, a boundary line, a fence, a guide for where to stop my inner feathers. Now today, we are talking about the outer feathers only. In December, we will finish this and put inner feathers in. But right now, we're only going to be working on the outside of the spine. So. Let's talk about um, getting these um, sizes. So this six inch block, I put a six inch um, circle in. So I have a six inch circle, and this happens to be uh, Quilter's Groove, Lisa Calle's rulers, so six inch. Now keep in mind that when a ruler says it's six inch, you need to double check and see if I were to draw right around the edge of that ruler, do you see that if I were to draw around it, I would not get a six inch circle. Instead, I would get a five and a half inch circle because a machine quilting ruler is built so that when your hopping foot goes up against it, and Kelsey, I'm gonna move the machine over here and maybe you can take the camera that's on the machine so they can see. Um, can you, is that good, can you see? Yeah. Okay, so the hopping foot, your ruler foot, whether you're a sit down or a stand up machine. Now, obviously I have the plastic still on this um, ruler, so ignore that, right? You take the plastic off of yours, but I, the LED's off, yep. Oh, it's probably off the plastic. Yeah, okay, so, so I, I just pulled this off our shelf, so that's why it has plastic on it. Um, you would take the plastic off, right? Yeah, okay, so. Um, the reason it is not a six inch circle, but it will give you a six inch circle is because your ruler foot, um, the needle is a quarter inch away from the edge of the hopping foot. And so as you travel and trace around the ruler, you're adding that quarter of an inch all the way around so that it will add a total of a half inch to that circle size. So this technically is a five and a half inch circle of acrylic when I stitch around it with my hopping foot or my um, ruler foot if you're on a domestic, a sit down domestic, um, I will get a six inch circle because of the distance between the edge of the foot and that needle. Um, Kelsey, can you take the um, other camera that I'm holding? My thumb, oh my thumb, oh sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay, so there was that six inch circle. So that was that outer ring to give me a boundary for where my exterior, my outer feathers are gonna stop. Now let's talk about this inner ring. This inner ring here is a two inch circle. And so to draw that, oh, oh, you know what? I, okay, so I was making a point about the six inch circle. It's actually a five and a half piece of acrylic. So I just wanted to show you how I would actually draw that on my fabric since my pencil, my chalk pencil here, um, I can't trace right up against the edge of the ruler. So what I use is this little drawing wheel and this little drawing wheel will give me that quarter inch spacing. So when I stick my chalk pencil in, it moves my chalk pencil so that it's a quarter inch away 
from the ruler and that will add that half inch all the way around so that I get a six inch circle from that five and a half inch piece of acrylic. I hope that's clear. If I were to stitch with it, I would, it, this is how I, I would add uh, where my needle actually would hit. So now I have my six inch circle. Let's talk about this interior circle. This interior circle is a two inch circle. And I ha I've used um, Lisa Kaye, these are all of her rulers. Um, so this is Quilter's Groove. And I use the two inch side, these kind of nest in together. I use the two inch side of her ruler. And you'll notice there's an interior circle here that you couldn't reach with your needle, right? Because there's no like entryway. It's a, it's a circle inside a piece of acrylic. So I can't get my hopping foot in there. So that circle is a two inch circle and it's used to actually draw and mark. So it gives me the actual size I need so I can use my marking device and not need a drawing wheel with this two inch circle. By the way, this side over here if I were to stitch around, do you see that it is one and a half inch circle piece of acrylic? So if I were to put my needle up next to it, I would actually get that two inch circle because it would add that quarter of an inch all the way around. So this one and a half inch circle of acrylic will give me a two inch circle when I'm done using it if I were to stitch around that. Now we're not gonna stitch around that circle. I just needed a two inch circle drawn so that I have a visual barrier so that when I do my, my interior feathers, I know where to stop so I don't go all the way into the center of my wreath. All right, so let's talk about the middle circle because the middle circle is my actual spine. This middle circle is a four inch circle. Okay, so that means I cannot go grab a four inch piece of acrylic, right? I need to go grab a three and a half inch piece of acrylic, but most rulers are marked. So here's the ruler I'm gonna use. Most rulers are marked, let's see. So this one you can see right there, it says four inches. It's actually, if you measure it, three and a half, but it will give me a four inch circle. So don't let this throw you. When you go looking at machine quilting rulers, um, they're a little different because they compensate for your ruler foot on your machine, whether you're using it with a sit-down domestic or a stand-up long arm machine. So this is the actual um, template I'm gonna use to stitch my spine, that center spine of my wreath. All right, so let's look at, um, Kelsey, I've got the, the size chart up here um, on the computer. So here's the magic numbers that you need. So um, I just took the most common block sizes. So you see there, if, you're, if you wanna put a feathered wreath in a four inch block, now, I would, I would have a very serious conversation with you. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> because it's gonna be a little bitty tiny, a little bitty tiny wreath. So think, think carefully before you make that decision. But if you wanna make that decision, here's the numbers you need. So the inner circle size would be an inch, and then the template size would be a two inch. That's gonna give you a two and a half inch. And then that outer circle is a four. Let's look at a six inch, which is what we're working with here today. There's that inner circle at two inches. The template size I need is three and a half. That will give me a four inch circle spine. The outer circle is six inches. Let's go all the way up to 12 inches. So I would have a four inch center circle. The template size I need for that interior spine is seven and a half, and then the outer circle, because that'll give me an eight inch um, middle circle, and then the outer circle is a 12. So if you are looking for, we've got this um, size chart on the Quilted Joy blog, so that you can go and reference it as needed. Um, and I encourage you to get out um, some circles or maybe some plates or some pots and pans and some paper and find yourself, you know, a, a six inch plate and find yourself a two inch plate and find yourself a four inch plate and make yourself a piece of paper that has these um, template guidelines on it so that you can practice and play at home um, using these uh, guidelines. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to show you um, 
is but the other tip I have for you is to go ahead and mark with a chalk pencil um, or whatever marking device you're using on whatever color. We're using black fabric here, so it's going to have to be just a white chalk pencil um, to be able to see it on camera. But go ahead and mark a few plumes. Now, when I start stitching this interior um, circle, I'm probably going to start at about 7 o'clock, right? So this is 12 o'clock, here's 6 o'clock, here's 3 o'clock, here's 9 o'clock. I'm going to start at about 7 o'clock and stitch around the circle. So when I hit about 7 o'clock, that's where I'm going to be ready to start making my feathers. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and stitch, and I'm going to have a hard time kind of holding the camera and seeing, but I will try my best. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to stitch, I'm going to mark a few plumes just like three. And it just gives me a guideline when I go to get started. Because what I have found is the first two plumes don't have the 45, see how that one, that first one's kind of flat? It's like until I start to get my groove, until I start to get that moment, that movement, I don't find the 45 degree angle that I need for the plume to come off the spine. So I, I mark a couple and then I'm going to ignore these marks as I come around um, because I want to really just start on this third one because that's the one I'm going to trust because I'm going to get my, my feel of my 45 after I draw a few. So that's my big tip for you is, is trace or or, or um, just draw a few plumes, but you aren't going to stitch these. Actually, I'm going to go through and erase them when we get started so I don't get confused as I come around. So I've got this on the computer. Um, let me pull it up here, Kelsey, and we will go over. Oops, sorry. Okay, great. All right. Yep. Okay, there you go. So it looks like we're hunting deer, right? <laughs> it looks like we got our... We got our bullseye and we're hunting deer, but that'll give us a chance to um, kind of show you how this works. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw those um, feathers initially. And these are my kind of placeholders that I'm probably not going to stitch, but they're going to give me a sense of that 45 degrees. So once I get my groove, I'll have that 45 degree angle ready to go. So I'm actually gonna go up here to this next one and I'm gonna change my color so that you can see that this would be what we'd actually start stitching. So I would stitch around the spine, that middle circle, and then I would start to draw or I'd start to stitch um, my, um, my feathers. So I would start to stitch and at this point, I, I'm just gonna go and start with that third one and that'll get me that 45 degree angle. And I am doing the bump or formal feathers for this. And the reason I've chosen the bump formal feathers is just because if I do my favorite, you guys have seen me do my little curled feather, um, it just doesn't, it's like if you don't time it right, you don't get, um, you know, when you go and meet the first plume that you did, you may or may not be on a curl. You may be on a regular feather and it just isn't gonna look all that great. Okay, once I get kind of away from where I started, I would go back and erase those initial um, feathers that I drew on the quilt as a registration. And then I can go ahead, so I would just leave my needle down and then I would, and I would probably do it when I hit the spine rather than up there at the top of the head of this feather. I'd probably put my needle down here and then go and erase those uh, few uh, plumes. You will get to the point where you don't need to erase them. You will just naturally ignore them. But when you first get started, definitely draw them. If you all have any questions about feathered wreaths or what I'm doing, just pop those in the chat and I'll see if I know the answer. I'm going to kiss the top of his head, come around and I'm looking ahead to the space I have to fill before I can meet up with where I started. So at this point, I'm thinking in my head, this is too big for one plume. So I need to fit two plumes in here. So 
didn't quite backtrack there very well. And there I've, I've entered, I've finished the, the wreath. Now, I, I quilt much better than I draw, um, but because you can see I, I overlapped um, as I came around. Um, but let's do it on the machine here. And I am going to bring my needle up, uh, bring my bobbin up. And I want you to see kind of how I'm holding this. Now, um, you want to look for a circle ruler that has nice registration lines. So you'll see this one has nice north and south, nice east and west. It even gives you diagonals. We're really just interested in those north, south, east, west lines. And so I'm going to put those north, south, east, west lines on the lines that I marked earlier. And I'm going to hold it with my non-dominant hand. And I've got it started at about that 7 o'clock position. And then I'm going to stitch around that circle template. Until I meet up with where I started. And I'll stitch these tails when we get away, when we start to go over here and erase um, the first few plumes that we did. Um, any questions that popped up? Uh, Pamela is asking, do we just stitch the middle circle? Yes, just the middle circle. Pamela, the other ones are just like guide rails so that you know where to stop your plumes because um, we're doing a traditional uh, feathered wreath. So you just need a, a way to kind of keep your circle-y circle circle and those um, registration lines will do that. All right, let's do that first plume. And I'm actually gonna do it as a hook, a ba bump and head back over. And now that I'm kind of out of the way of my thread tails, I'm gonna go ahead and cut those. And I'm also using bright, shiny gold thread so that you can see it. Um, I would definitely recommend using a thread that blends. Um, a skinny thread will also be more helpful to you as you first get started on wreaths. Kissing the top of the head, and there's that ba-bump. So you go up, kiss the top of the neighbor's head, trace back over, kick back out. And as one of my quilting heroes, Karen McTavish, says, think skinny thoughts. When you're doing formal Amish ba-bump over the top feathers, think skinny thoughts. But if, you know, this is, this is the hardest feather to do because of this backtracking. So I encourage you to play with other plumes and see what other ideas you might have to put on a feathered wreath that might be a little bit more friendly to your brain. So I'm going for symmetry. I'm going for a 45 degree angle coming into that spine, but I'm not getting all bunched up if I don't achieve it, because I am not a computer. I'm a human, and I don't, I, I can't, I can't get the perfection of a computer. All right, I'm just gonna erase those plumes that I sketched initially just to get myself started. And now I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna complete my wreath. Ba bump over the top. And one last plume, and there we go. All right, I'm gonna bring, I, I'm gonna take just a few little tacking stitches, and then I'm gonna bring my bobbin thread up to the top and snip it. Now, if this were something super formal, I may take the time to knot and bury, um, but I'm just gonna do that so that you guys can see, and I'm gonna move the camera around so hopefully you can see we did the outside portion of our wreath and next month in December, come back because we will talk about how to do the inside portion. The inside portion is just a little trickier. So play with that outside portion now and then come back in December and we'll talk about the interior portion. Um, did any other questions come up, yeah, Jesse? Lori has a question about what stitch length we're using. Oh, Lori. Um, I don't know, about that big. <laughs> um, on an APQS machine, it's, it doesn't have a specific number. It's kind of in the 12 inch, 13 inch range. Um, it's really more like, when I'm trying to decide what size stitch, here's how I do it. I look at the stitches and I think, how painful would this be to pick out? 
Like, would I want to pick it out or would I just go get a Coke and like wait until the anxiety leaves me? So if, if, if I have that reaction to it, if I look at it and I go, yeah, no, I, I don't want to pick that out, then my stitch length is too small. Um, if I look at it and I go, holy cow, I could, I could snip one of those threads and like three would come out with it, well then my stitch length is too big. So there you go, there's my scientific answer for how to find your stitch length. Um, see, just check yourself and see if you'd want to pick that out or if you'd go, no stinking way am I doing that. That's how you know. Um, any other questions? So you've got your spine and you want the plume of the feather to come off at a 45 degree angle from that spine. But Vicki, don't go get a ruler and mark your 45s because it'll drive you crazy. Just be in the neighborhood. You're aiming for it. One of the things that I find is if people learn how to, and this was in a past clubhouse we talked about, if you've learned how to feather on a straight spine, um, those are super hard to get 45 degree angles because you've got to like travel and move on the spine and kick out. The straight spine uh, feathers are not very common in the quilting world, but for some reason that's where a lot of teachers start um, teaching feathers and it's not as helpful, I don't think. So consider the gracefulness of your plumes. It's just a way to check yourself. If you look at your spine and check yourself and to see, am I at a 45 or I'm more like a 90? If you're at a 90, you're getting a very different look to your feather. They're not gonna have the gracefulness that a 45 degree feather would have. Any other questions? All right, awesome. Yeah, what was, yeah? I noticed you seem like you were really taking your time. Is that like the speed that you would normally quilt? You know, so, so Kelsey's asking about how fast I would do these feathers. So bump feathers, formal over the top feathers, you do have to slow down because you're trying to backtrack right on top of the stitching line. And it is difficult to do, that is, that is, and you'll see, if you look here, Kelsey, we'll point out all my mistakes. If you, if you look, I wasn't, you know, truly super duper accurate, which is why I say pick a thread that blends so that all your mistakes, and I wouldn't call these mistakes again, I'm not a computer. I don't want to be a computer. I think that this hand guided look has soul, it has depth, it has warmth. And a computerized wreath is going to look a little colder to me, to my eye. It's not going to have those small human variations. So I'm gonna go a little slower. For one thing, I wanna hit the top of that wreath. For another thing, I'm on camera and I'm talking to you. <laughs> and so, and I'm quilting a feathered wreath live with formal Amish over the top feathers. So I'm gonna go a little slower. But um, you know, if, that, if, if, if you don't like that look or that look is that over the top feather is too hard, go through some of those other plumes that we talked about. You know, the, the plume that we've done that's just a curl, every one of them is a curl. Not the one that, that I've told you is my personal go-to favorite where it's a curl and then a, a feather plume and then a curl and then a feather plume. Go to the one that's just curls. Every single plume is a curl and it will be much easier and much uh, more forgiving to put it on a wreath. I wanted to show you a, a truly traditional feathered wreath. The other thing I would say too, Kelsey, if you could take this camera. So we put this outer circle here to give us a visual barrier of where we need to stop our plume so that we wind up with a circly circle wreath. Your other option would be to go ahead and kick your plumes out and fill in, you may have seen this, fill in this whole corner and it completely changes the look of that feathered wreath, but it's not super traditional. And I wanted to show you super, super traditional um, feathered wreath. So, um, so I told you about the, where you can go to get the wreath sizes. So you can go to our Quilted Joy um, blog and you can see the wreath sizes. And I apologize, it sounds like there's a giant um, knocking on the door. Our neighbor is putting up shelving. And so you're gonna hear some bangs and some, um, some, some noises, so I apologize. And then um, I also wanted to show you some of the marking tools that I use. So um, the one that I was using here um, was a chalk pencil and, <clears throat> pardon me, Got a couple of versions. There's the Bowen chalk pencil. There's the Soline chalk pencil. And it just gives you a really fine uh, tip to the chalk. And so that is super, super helpful. And then um, you can also find it, because we used white, right? But if I were on a different color fabric, I may want a different color chalk. And this one has white, pink, and black in it. It's a multicolor, and you just um, select which color you want to use in your chalk pencil. And then to erase it, um, oh, and then the other one, if this was white, 
fabric, I'd probably grab this, which is a purple. I'd probably use purple and not the blue, um, but I'd use the purple to do those um, circles and those first few plumes. Um, and then to take those off, um, this little tool has become one of my favorite things. It's an aqua pin um, by Soline. And again, you can find these on our website. But if you've ever had to pick something out, um, so, so for sure, the, this would take out that purple. It would take out the blue too, but you may need to use more of it to take out the blue, but for sure it would take out the purple right away. But what I love it for is if I have to pick out an area and I need those holes of the previous stitching line to kind of all the fibers of the, the fabric to go back together, this little um, water pen, I can just rub over those um, lines. You're not gonna be able to see it because I'm on black, but it'll, it'll close those holes holes up um, and where I've picked out the threads it'll kind of go away so I become a big fan of this um, of this pen and you can find um, all of our marking pens and those little drawing wheels that we were talking about too um, all on our website here's those little there's a little package of three that come these still have the uh, paper coating on it you'd peel those off and it's just a clear um, purple uh, drawing wheel but that'll add that quarter inch spacing you need to use your machine quilting rulers to trace and to draw with. Um, were there any other questions that arose, Jesse? Yeah, I had one where Sandra is asking if you would call the feathers calf parts or more of a teardrop shape. So Sandra you, uh, was asking if we would call the feathers half heart or more of a teardrop shape. Sandra, whatever works for you. I've heard them called ears. Um, I've heard them call, um, be called um, uh, uh, threes, like a, the lower half of a, a backwards three. If a heart works for your brain, go with a heart. If an ear works for your brain, go with an ear. Um, all of that will give you that, that look that we're after. Go pleasing to your eye. Don't get into this, oh, it has to be approved by the quilt police. I don't believe in the quilt police. I don't listen to the quilt police. I don't particularly care for the quilt police. You make it pleasing to your eye and it'll be beautiful to you. And that's what you're after. Don't compare yourself to other people and other quilters. You are your own quilter. Any other questions that arose? Cheryl was wondering what weight thread we were using. Oh, great question, Cheryl. We have a 40 weight thread that has a little bit of a sheen to it. Um, and there are many different, um, we actually just added a whole bunch of new colors. You could use Glide for this. Um, again, though, if you're doing, you know, gold Glide thread on black, fabric 40 weight it's going to show when you don't hit the top of when you don't backtrack specifically on your line so you may go with something skinnier to try this at first you may look at a 60 weight that would probably be a great choice um, for the first time you try to stitch this and of course i would just put some play fabric just make yourself a little sandbox and play um, don't go grab your um, your double wedding ring that you've been working on for five years and start doing feathered wreaths inside your double wedding ring um, that's not the place to start practicing uh, but a 60 weight thread i think would be probably the best choice as you get going so i was living on the edge here with 40 weight so that you guys could see it really well <laughs> any other uh, questions that came up Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, hopefully that was helpful. I would love to see your wreaths in the clubhouse. So post them in the clubhouse so we can see your doodles. You know, doodle on paper, paper first. Don't start with the machine. Start with paper. And I tell you, you saw me drawing on the computer. It's not going to look that hot, but if you've got the path in your brain on the paper, then when you go to the computer, it will translate. So. All right, well, I wanted to thank our sponsor, um, APQS. APQS makes uh, long arm quilting machines. They are 100% handcrafted in Iowa. They're love the world over, and APQS comes with a industry-leading lifetime warranty. So thank you so much, APQS. If you are interested in an APQS machine, contact your local store, your local APQS store, your local APQS dealer, or give APQS a call. You can find them at APQS.com. Thanks, APQS. We love you. All right, so I have a fantastic studio tour. You're going to love um, how she has her studio laid out. This is Tamara Bobbitt, and she let us kind of come in a few weeks ago and be nosy. So we recorded this a few weeks ago, um, but I think you're going to enjoy the way she has her studio laid out. Let's take a look. Hi, Tamara. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, it was good to see you today. Tell me, where are you located? In Trinity, Texas. I'm about 30 minutes from Huntsville. Okay, now I got to say, I don't even know where Huntsville, Texas is. Where's that in Texas? 
two hours north of Houston. Okay, I know where Houston is. <laughs> I have definitely been to Houston. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for letting us kind of peep in your room and see what you got. So can you turn the camera around and we can take a look at your space? I will. Oh, so you have like a walkout. Is that a walkout basement or are you on the first floor? I'm on the first floor. This is actually an efficiency area uh, that was uh, about a 200 square foot uh, efficiency when we bought the house and then we subsequently built it out to 400 square feet. So I have quite a bit of room down here. That's my uh, sewing table, of course, where I uh -huh. piece and I do a lot of binding for people. A lot of people don't want to do their own binding. Yes. Uh, or they may have me do it partially where I only sew one side and then they take it home and finish it up. Sure. And this is my Maybe Millie sure. on right. her 12 foot uh, bliss frame. Uh -huh. And I have- and it looks do you have a batting bar underneath? Is that what I saw? I do have a batting bar underneath and I do store my batting under there because being in a, a small area, it really helps to have that. I uh -huh. also have uh, several rolls uh, in a storage area, which is really helpful. That way I don't ever, don't ever run out and I can carry more than one uh, brand of batting. So I have Quilter's Dream, mm -hmm. uh, some Windline and, uh, uh, different brands, Kyoto for the uh, bamboo batting. This is uh -huh. uh, my um, yeah, stash see, uh, area. And pre so it's, bobbins. It's a little stash area, yeah, where uh -huh. I keep all the things connected with my longworm. Yeah. This chest holds all my different threads and my bobbins. Okay, and can you open the drawer or is that asking too much, Tamara? Oh, no. Can we see oh, your no. threads? I have a lot of, yeah, I'm really, oh, yeah, uh, I'm really a collector of threads. And I also have some in another, uh, another area over there. That, yeah. Uh, that's mainly my glide thread, but I uh -huh. also have a collection of so fine and uh, superior threads. Uh, this table right here is rather invaluable. It houses all of Millie's best friends and her work tools, my marking tools, uh, my best press, and Millie likes to be kept very clean. So I yes. have my perfect duster, w, uh, WD-40 and all those good and moving on into the other, what I'd refer to as the other half, this is the yeah. initial area that was uh, here before the build out. So mm -hmm. I have a drafting table and it's got my 108 inch uh, fabrics my underneath packs. there yeah. and uh, my Sizzix cutter, which I use to strip cut because I do a lot of bindings and the, for mm -hmm. t-shirt quilts, it's invaluable. On top, so I can, um, you cut everything on that drafting table. That's where you do your major cutting. I do. Um, I, I was able to pick this up at an estate sale in Kansas, and I love oh, it because yeah, it's, it's even got a sturdy. drawer. It's super sturdy. It's got a couple of drawers in it, and it also has that really nice stash area underneath where it holds those hundred and eight inch bolts. Right. Um, and then I, I noticed you have a heat press. What do you use I do the heat have press a heat for? Press. Uh, I use the heat press for t-shirt quilts. And that has been one of my best buys as far as equipment investment. Um, that heat press has saved me so much time uh, from sitting in front of movies and, and holding an iron on uh, <laughs> Stabilizer. It also uh, causes it to adhere a lot better, and I've mastered the heat settings on it. I believe. Did you put out a video on using a heat? Yes, press? a very, very thank long you. time ago. Yeah, yeah. and thank yeah. you because I watched that video, and after that, I got a heat press. Well, good. Awesome. I'm glad that it's saving you some time and effort. It is. All right, so is. you have more fabric. I saw to your left. I do. Uh, I do, and. These fabrics, I am. I carry a few because a lot of people come in and they have the top and no backing. These are the 44-inch fabrics, and mm -hmm. I am uh, phasing those out to a certain extent and going more with the 108 because if they buy it here, then I end up doing the Having job that it. I really don't really want, yeah. which is piecing their backing. I charge sure. for it, but I just assume it would be 108-inch backing and not have to worry about it. Yeah. This is my jobs table. It holds uh, uh, jobs that I currently have. Most oh. of those are uh, pantographs, probably five custom uh, multiple jobs in the bag. So it's going really well right now. Fantastic it's always good to camera. With the, yeah. With the thing there. 
Thank you so much for the tour. I really enjoyed seeing your space. Um, tell me, I want to know three things that you would recommend to your bestie. They don't have to be quilt related, but what three things would you recommend? A uh, few things have happened in life lately that um, I guess as you get older, you discover that things, there's some things that are going to happen that you just can't really do much about. For things of that nature, I would recommend just spending time with your family and the people that you love. And I do get up early every morning and spend a substantial amount of time on devotionals. To me, that's really important. Uh, and I'm a Christian, so I read my Bible and spend that time praying. And a lot of times it does, I feel like it really saves me time later in the day because things I would have agonized over, a lot of times the decision comes really easy to me. And it also uh, helps me to develop patience and uh, and fortitude and and uh, and don't rush it because you want to put out a good product for every single customer. Every job is important. Well, thank you so much, Tamara. Where can people connect with you if they want to find you online? They can connect with me at info at foxtailquilting.com or they can check out my site at uh, www.foxtailquilting.com. I also am on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, but Instagram and Facebook are the main ones that people look at anyway. So those have served me pretty well. Well, thank you for spending some time with us, Tamara. It was lovely to see your space. You really have it well um, thought through and organized. And I can see that you um, really support your customers well. And I'm sure that they appreciate it too. So we'll see you in the clubhouse. Thanks for all your time. Thank you. Doesn't she have a lovely studio? If I am ever in your neck of the woods, Tamara, I want to sit on the porch right outside the front door in a rocking chair and talk quilts with you and enjoy your space. You have a beautiful area to quilt in. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. All right, we are going to talk about my favorite things for this month. And my favorite things for this month have to do with those feathered wreaths that we were talking about. So um, uh, we've got a link for you so that you can go and find all those circles. And we have a circle pack where it has all of the um, evens. And then we have a circle pack that's all of the odd sizes. Um, so you can grab um, a bunch of circles that you can play with. You'd probably want to grab some of those drawing wheels so that you have a way to, to make them, this, you know, if you're going to use them to, to draw with, that you have a way to do that. And you'll also find on the website, these um, these are called Pro Pebbles. This is the Pro Pebble one that has the one inch and the two inch size and they interlock together and they have both the drawing area as well as the stitching area um, on, the, on the ruler. So those are my favorite things for this month. Okay, so we always ask you in the clubhouse if you um, want to um, put in a photograph of a quilt top unquilted and then have me kind of, I, what I do is I pick one and then kind of walk you through my thought process so that you can kind of see how I read a quilt, how I break down a quilt and how I would determine what I would quilt on it if it were my quilt. So um, this month I've chosen Sue B's quilt. Um, yay, Sue! Um, this was just such a dramatic and geometric, beautiful quilt. And so really the first thing that I'm going to do when I look at a quilt is I'm gonna kind of an, um, take a like an overall picture of it. I, I wanna have in my head, are there problem areas? Are there places that I want to avoid the eye or draw the eye away from? Or are there places that I wanna pull the eye towards because the piecing is spot on? And I want you to appreciate how glorious Sue's piecing is. I'm gonna zoom in here so that you can appreciate with me. Take a look at those striped, sashings. Now, she cut those. They're so perfect. She took so much time to cut those so that she didn't have wandering wiggly lines. She had straight lines. And look at how they line up across from those cornerstones too. Sue, I am so stinking impressed. You did a fabulous job. And so when I looked at this, the first thing I thought is I do not want to draw the eye away from the straightness of the fabric and the pattern and the lines that she's created. I want to pull my eye right towards um, her piecing because she did such a spectacular job um, on this quilt. So as I started to look 
at this design, at this quilt top, and what I would do with it, and how it has those overlaying squares, and the eye kind of dances between those kind of squares that are created by the green to the squares that are created by the blue. I thought, you know what? I could probably make a whole other square in there too, so I have a third square. So my first thought was to actually go in, and I'm gonna um, zoom in, because I think that's gonna help you guys see a little bit better. So my first thought, was I actually want to go through, and of course I'm doing this freehand, not, um, let's see if I can do it with straight lines. I think I can, there I go. So I thought, you know, if I could do straight lines, now I'm not worrying about a um, continuous path yet. I'm just trying to kind of get a sense of design and then I'll start to worry about my actual path. So don't get yourself, you know, kind of locked in. Here, let's do this one. Don't get yourself locked in to this idea that you have to, at the same time you're coming up with the design, also come up with the path. Those are two completely separate thought processes. Uh, let's see, that one was off. Whoop, again. Okay, so I thought, you know, if I can keep on going. So that was around the blues. And then let's do it up here just so that you can start to see how it comes together. All right, so I would do that first. So let's take a look at what all of those little inner squares look like. So I'm gonna zoom out just so that you can see what our quilt looks like now. So do you see how I've added another layer of square? So it's square and a square and a square. Um, and it just adds a lot of um, interesting variety. So then I started to think about, okay, so what am I gonna do about those brown squares? I'm gonna zoom in here so that we can see a little bit better. Those olive brown squares, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna fill that space? And I thought I really wanna keep everything kind of simple because there's such strong geometry in her quilt. But I thought I would like to make it a little bit softer. So I thought, you know, if I just did an arc in and an arc out, right? So an arc in and an arc out. Again, I'm not worrying about path. I'm worrying about design right now. But at the same time, do you see how I have an easy, if I come in here, I have an easy way to dip into that arc if I need it. I also have an easy way to enter that arc with whatever is going on, whatever I do in this area, I could use that to enter, to have my magic portal to where I could enter and put an arc in the space. I could enter the space. So I am noticing as I'm designing where my little magic portals are, so that as I start to think about a path to create this, um, I can understand where my options might be. All right, so let's take a look at what that is going to look like. Um, let's see if I, I think I have to, you know what? Okay, so there we go. I'm going to zoom out so that we can see that. All right, so then I started thinking about, well, you know, that's that now I have those arches in that olive green brown area but what about that white area what about that white area well I could just mimic I could just do the same thing here so now I have an arc that's coming out and going into each of these blues and again my magic portal can be can come off of this as well. Now I can dip into it uh, from that cornerstone that's coming off the blue lines as well. All right, so let me uh, control Z all of that and turn on the next layer because I want you to see what that looked like. All right, I'm gonna zoom out. So now you see I have both arches, both little arcs, both into the white and into the olive green brown area. Um, and so at this point I got a little distracted because I thought those straight lines, you know, I talked about how precise her piecing was and how great her cutting was um, and how those lines in the fabric were kept super, super straight. So at this point I thought, you know what I wanna do is I just wanna, I wanna enhance it. So I wanna just do straight lines and I did I thought you know if I can do two if I can do two lines then when I do these I would return back to where I started 
So two lines on my greens and I thought, okay, same thing with those little blue, blue lines too, because they are also pieced so extraordinarily well. And so again, by doing two lines, because it's an even number, um, we've talked about the magic rule of thirds before, because it's an even number, it's gonna return me back to where I started. All right, so let me uh, control Z all that and I'm gonna turn on the next layer so you can see what it looks like when I add those straight lines all along her quilt. So there you go. Um, so then I started thinking, I still, I feel like I wanna add a little bit more flare. I feel like, let me zoom in so I can show you. When I got to this point, I thought, I really feel like I need to do something in this white space here. So I'm still in the design mode. I kind of have a path flowing in my head now that I, I know more about my design, but I thought I'd really like to do something in these whites. And I thought, well, what about little lollipop trees? So if I, when I come into this arc and I meet that point, what if I go out, a little lollipop tree, back down, a little lollipop tree, back in. And what if I do that on each of these? So when I reach this intersection, I would then head out and back in with little lollipop trees. So as I'm going around and I do this first arc here, when I enter that intersection, I pop out lollipop tree, head back, pop out lollipop tree, head back. I do that straight line, come back, that straight line, come back, arc down, arc up, finish that arc and I'm back to my entry point. So it gives me a place to enter here. And I thought, well, how would I enter it here? Well, when I'm doing my straight lines, I have the opportunity to bounce between each of those corners of that cornerstone. All right, I'm gonna zoom in so you can see what I just did, because I want you to see I've just, I've just found the portal. So by bouncing between, I'm gonna do it over here, by bouncing between the corners, I'm able now to enter this space. Do this whole thing, the arc, lollipop trees, finish this arc, this corner, this corner, finish this arc, bounce into this corner, now I can drop in and do this space. So that gives me a chance to enter each of my little magic portals to get there. And if I miss one, by the way, notice that I also have the same opportunity when I go to do these green cornerstones. I have the same opportunity to enter that magic portal to take care of that space and put my little, when I reach that intersection, put my little lollipop trees. All right, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Hopefully I can undo all those lollipops. Okay, I think I got it. All right, so there's my straight lines. Let's look at our lollipop trees and I'm gonna zoom out. Okay, Sue. Oh, look, I missed a lollipop. I wonder if you can see that. Y'all see I missed a lollipop? This is what always happens. I pull it off the frame and then I go, oh no. Now I can't even find it. Oh, there he is. Okay, so I missed a lollipop. Lollipop tree, lollipop tree. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna zoom out, Sue. All right, so there is your quilt, Sue. But then I wanted to look at your border and we've got in the, I really love it, Sue. I, I, Sue, you can do whatever you want on your quilt, but I really like this, this, uh, this idea for your quilt top. So no pressure, you do what you want, but I, this is what I would do. Um, so on that outside border, what I thought to kind of soften it, now you could certainly do piano keys, beadboard, straight line designs, but I'd really like to soften the outside edge of that quilt since there's so much geometry going on in the inside of the quilt. And so I'm not gonna be able to draw this super well but I thought if I could just put swags, I'm gonna zoom in so that hopefully you can see a little bit better. So I'm going from intersection to intersection. Let's see if I can pan over, hopefully I can. Intersection to intersection with a swag. And I think it'll just soften it up in this corner I would do a swag out, a swag in, and then head down the side. All right, Sue, so, let's see if I can erase all that because I want you to see what it looks like with the swags. I'm gonna zoom out and I'm gonna center it a little bit, hopefully. So there's the swags. And then I thought that probably is too much space. 
So then I thought if I just go in and I do a second swag, so double swags, for one thing, it would um, hide any inconsistencies with my arc. And it would give me a chance to fill that space. And of course, depending on how much space you have to fill, I mean, frankly, this would be a great spot for a lollipop tree right there. Right, go up, go in a circle, come back down. So when I come into my second swag, I could go up, circle, come back down, and add a little lollipop tree on each of those. It would be kind of cute. Okay, so Sue, I'm gonna um, take all this off and turn on the second swag. And then I'm gonna zoom out to fit, hopefully. Zoom to fit image in window. All right, Sue, there you go. That is kind of how I focused on design first and then focused on paths to get there. And by the way, if it means that you have to break your thread, you haven't like, you know, destroyed the earth, you've just broken your thread. So don't get too bunched up about it, just break your thread. So I hope you like that, Sue, and I really hope that you post um, what you do on it, Sue, um, in our clubhouse. And if there's a quilt that you wanna, um, you wanna have be considered for our design time with the clubhouse, just go into our Facebook group. And each month when I ask for people to post a photo, um, if you just comment in that post, then I will select one that we can have here in the clubhouse. Jesse, do we have any questions? Yeah, Nancy was wondering Oh, thank you, Nancy. I normally say that and I forgot to. So um, I'm using GIMP, G-I-M-P, and it's a free program. It works on both Mac and PC. And what it allows me to do is bring in a photo of a quilt and then have different transparent layers on top of that photo so that I can doodle and design and then hide layers and reveal layers and delete layers until I kind of get a sense of what block design do I like, with what sashing design do I like, with what border design do I like. And so it helps me kind of audition and draw, and then to draw, actually, I'm just using a, um, a tablet, so it's just a glorified mouse. That's really all it is. It's just the mouse is in the shape of a pen so that I can draw a little bit more easily. So this particular one is made by Wacom. I got it a bazillion years ago. I don't think they make this one anymore. Um, I think the one that they make now is called a bamboo, maybe? Um, and I think you can get it for like 60 to $80. They have some that are thousands of dollars for um, actual graphic designers you know, of magazines and things. You don't need that. You just need the home variety. Um, but it's just so much easier to draw with a pen rather than a mouse. Any other questions, Jesse? No, I see awesome. Okay, so um, so I hope that you enjoyed that, Sue, and um, uh, I would love to see what, what you came up with um, over in the clubhouse, Sue. Um, thank you so much for putting it up there, and it was a delight working on it. Um, you piece spectacularly, so thanks for that. All right, so um, let's see. We have a show and tell. Um, I also wanted to um, talk about um, if you would take the time to review us on Google, um, it really helps the big algorithm, the Google algorithm, kind of find us. Um, we're a tiny little shop in Louisville, Kentucky, um, all woman powered, and we are small but mighty. Um, and it would be um, a great boost to our business if you were to post a review. It just helps Google kind of find us and then serve us up to other people. And I read every review personally, and I just thank you for the time. And if you know someone who might benefit or enjoy the Clubhouse, um, that truly is the greatest compliment you could give would be to share Share this with someone that you think would enjoy it. Um, and I appreciate your time and I appreciate um, you being with us today and sharing it with friends, quilty friends that you have. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the quilts that have been shared in the clubhouse. Um, uh, we have had so many wonderful um, quilts shown. And this one was Barbara G and she did an all over edge to edge on this Irish chain with this cute little daisy print and it just adds such nice texture and movement onto her quilt. Tammy H um, posted this one, isn't this fun with the fall with the pumpkins and the little barn and she also did an all over edge to edge so many times we look at quilts like this that have a lot of applique or you know specific sampler blocks and we think how in the heck are we going to quilt this notice how effective it is to just have an all over edge to edge she used a little pumpkin pattern with pumpkin leaves and curls super super cute tammy great great job um deb posted this one she said that she just got her uh, machine recently and she's been watching the clubhouse and she attempted feathers there 
there. You did a great job, Jet Deb. She put feathers in the light side of that log cabin and then little wiggly uh, lines in the dark side of the log cabin. Great job, Deb. And Cheryl, I was so impressed with this, Cheryl. Cheryl did this one. She said the pattern came out of a uh, Love of Quilting magazine from November of 2019. Don't you love the pumpkins in the four corners of the block? And then Cheryl posted some close-up photos of how she quilted it. She did um, feathers in the outside. Um, again, she's been joining us for a year of feathers, so she put feathers on the outside, and then she did some ruler work on the inside of the quilt. And Cheryl um, uh, said that um, one of the things that, that she's picked up from watching me is I always say, you know, do one new thing on a quilt and then go back to your happy place because otherwise if you do loads of new things on a quilt, it can overwhelm you. So just pick one new thing per quilt and exp expand your wings um, for that one new thing and then go back to your happy place. Great job, Cheryl. Um, Elise is also a fairly new owner. She has been playing with her machine. She's doing a lot of charity quilts, um, which is giving her a great place to play. Take a look at the quilt in the upper left. She put little dog bones in the outside um, border, all free motion, so much fun, and then lots of ruler work, lots of places to play. Um, I would tell you that, that charity quilts are just a really great place to get your feet wet and um, to kind of practice your designs. They're nice little sandboxes to enjoy. And don't you love all those batiks um, in that quilt on the right? Um, Elise says that her group that she works with, um, they piece the tops and then they're handing them off to her to quilt and she's having a ball. Um, Barbara Kay did this sampler. Sampler quilts are difficult because many times you want to do something different in each block and Barbara put lots of photos up in the Quilted Joy Clubhouse of how she did each of these blocks and Barbara you did a great job. I love how Barbara used some ruler work and some line work. If you look at the center of that 50-40 um, uh, block there on the left she used little matchstick um, refrigerator coil lines, little small lines to just enhance that four patch in the center of that block and then use some ruler work to echo um, those uh, V blocks. Great job, Barbara. And do go check out all of the other blocks that Barbara posted there in the Quilted Joy Clubhouse. I think you'll enjoy how she broke down each of the blocks. Um, Roger posted this one. So Roger took ties that his brother uh, would wear to work and then made a quilt out of it. And I gotta say, Roger, looking at all of these ties that your brother wore, I totally want to know your brother because your brother looks like a cool, fun guy. Um, my dad also liked all of the the great ties, all the fun ties. I especially love, if you look in the lower row, the second block from the left, there's an operation, you know, the, the Milton Bradley operation game that, that we played as kids. There's a tie there with the, with the operation guy. So funny. Great job, Roger. Um, Susie, this looks like it's in a magazine. Susie posted this one. Isn't that gorgeous on the, on the baby's crib? And um, some people would shy away from using uh, lines, black and white lines like that, but won't the baby love um, the stark uh, contrast between the black and the white? And it's all too the pink fabric is just beautiful. Great job, Susie. Athena posted this one, and Athena did all of the dye, all of this fabric she used, um, she hand dyed it. It's all ice dye. And I don't know if you've ever done um, dyeing, but it's kind of, you're kind of gambling. You're just kind of rolling the dice and then checking out and seeing if you like what happens. And Athena, I love what happened. You did a fabulous job. Um, and notice how she pieced it, just simple little bunny hops and so super effective. She even um, ice dyed her backing fabric. And there's more photos there in the Quilted Joy Clubhouse um, of her quilt. Really gorgeous. Um, Rhonda posted this one again as sampler. Again, she's done each block differently and she said that her daughter um, actually pieced this and she's been using this to practice with. And um, if you take a look on the left, I've given you a little close-up of one of the blocks to show how she did it. And I really like her flower bloom. So in that half square triangle, sometimes we think we have to have a specific shape or something going on in the dark side of the half square triangle, a specific shape going on in the light side of the triangle. And that shows how effective it can be to just have one shape that crosses over the light and the dark. Rhonda, great job. I really love your ribbon candy in the sashing as well. Again, more pictures from Rhonda are over in the Quilted Joy Clubhouse. So go check it out and see everything that Rhonda did. Um, just a, a fabulous job. And I appreciate you guys so much. Um, posting what you're working on the clubhouse. Um, it's always fun to see uh, what you are doing. 
Okay, so next month's program is going to be on Wednesday, December the 2nd at 1 o'clock Eastern, and we are going to be talking about the interior of the feathered wreath. So practice now and then be ready to tackle the inside of the wreath. And do join us on social. Um, we are on Facebook, and you will also um, you'll find our Facebook page. Um, where we post a lot of things about what's going on in the shop, and then you'll find the um, Quilted Joy Clubhouse, um, which is where we kind of party and, and kick back and have fun. And then you'll also find us on Instagram. A lot of time on, on Instagram, I'll post more personal stuff about what's going on in my little world. And then you'll find loads of tutorials and great um, videos over on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you to um, follow us on social and um, make sure that you subscribe. And that way you'll be notified um, every time a new video is posted. So um, thank you so much. And I will see you on Wednesday, December the 2nd, 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific. All right, bye guys. See ya.